to uh, to the start of Saber Virtual. We've got uh, got 12 days of research presentations and a few different uh, panel discussions and conversations lined up for uh, for those 12 days. So I'm hopeful that many of you are going to get the chance to uh, to join throughout. Uh, tonight we do have a slight change of the schedule. Um, you'll be hearing from three research presentations uh, instead of four. Uh, so those research presenters are Mark Cantor, John Burbridge, and Paul Simonelli. Uh, if you do have questions for the presenters, uh, please do uh, do everyone the favor of using the chat. Uh, because we are using the chat for questions, please avoid using the chat for general conversation. Uh, you do have the ability to direct message everybody by using the uh, drop down and select selecting a specific person. Uh, but go ahead and keep the general chat free uh, for everyone. I have one other request uh, to try to keep our bandwidth up uh, and also minimize distractions. Uh, if you could go ahead and turn off video unless you are one of this evening's presenters, uh, that will help everybody out. Uh, that way uh, the presenters will pop up to the top uh, and we'll also know who it is that's, uh, that's presenting and speaking. So you could go ahead and turn off your own video. Uh, that would be helpful to everyone. Uh, so with those, with those questions taken care of, uh, I've got one more little housekeeping thing. Uh, you probably saw the announcement about our Sabre Virtual Raffle. Uh, we've got some really cool prizes, including a lineup card that was autographed by Tony Gwynn, uh, a vintage Hank Aaron figurine, and other baseball memorabilia. You go to sabre.org slash virtual meetings, find the online raffle bullet point, and uh, you can check out more information there. We'll announce those winners on July 26th. Uh, so, as I said, we've got three research presenters this evening. Uh, the first is Mark Cantor. Uh, Mark Cantor has been a Sabre member since 1985. He has made numerous research presentations at regional meetings from Boston to Washington, D.C. and at National Sabre Conventions. He has written a number of articles for the Baseball Research Journal and for other Sabre publications. Mark was the editor of the 2002 Boston Sabre 32 convention publication, The Northern Game and Beyond, Baseball in New England and Eastern Canada. He has been a member of 12 National Sabre Team Trivia Championships. Mark grew up in Bristol, Pennsylvania, where his family lived in a house adjacent to the Delaware River. Until the current situation, he had been following his favorite team, the Phillies. He and his wife, Lynn Glickman, a Sabre member in her own right, have seen baseball games in Japan, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Canada. They live in the idyllic seaside community of Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Mark Cantor, the floor is yours. Do you, do you uh, see that, Scott? I do, I do, okay. you're all set. Or wherever you guys are, we're going, to, I'm gonna talk about Frank Robinson changes everything. And it's a discussion about how when Frank Robinson was traded from the Reds to the Orioles, how it changed the, uh, uh, almost the uh, mindset, the gestalt of the uh, Orioles and their relationship with, with Baltimore, and as well as their com competitiveness. You might want to understand, might try to understand why, um, why did I even become an Oriole fan? Well, in 1970, when I was 14 years old, I went to Camp Airy, which is in Thermont, Maryland, right near Camp David. And people know Maryland, it's, it's, in the, um, it's in the panhandle of the state, the western part of the state. I was surrounded by Orioles and Senators fans. About four days into the, that camp season, Frank Robinson, two grand slams against the Senators on Friday, June 26, 1970. That was probably a good way to get me interested in the Orioles as opposed to the Senators. 
I have a picture here on the left. I'm, I'm a counselor in training in 1973. We're all rag, rag, ragamuffin guys there. I'm 17. I'll let you figure out where I'm standing. I'm in the second row. And then on the right, it's, I'm a counselor in 1975. I'm in the second row there as well. So when the Orioles showed up in Baltimore in 1954, it was at least by the uh, expertise of Jacob Levine in baseball as a bridge on the border and baseball as a driving force for desegregation in Baltimore, race and ethnicity on the base paths. Jacob Le Levine at the Cooperstown, uh, Cooperstown Symposium uh, around four or five years ago said, it was the most segregated city in the United States. Pretty amazing, a northern city, but it was still below the Mason, -Dix still below the Mason Dixon line. The 1954 opening day lineup was white, which is interesting uh, considering that, um, you know, the St. Louis Browns, their predecessor had had some black players, including Satchel Paige. By the time Frank Robinson shows up, uh, he, segregation is still being practiced in some form in 1966. Oh, the Orioles had black players, just not a star until 1966. Uh, and the reason I'm saying black players is as opposed to African Americans, because later on in the presentation, we'll be talking about players like Minnie Minoso and Tony Oliva, who were dark complexion, but they would have to handle and they would have to deal with the same things as African American players did in the uh, 50s and 60s. Blacks were not showing up in great droves at Memorial Stadium to watch the Orioles, but they were showing up to watch the Colts, the uh, NFL team. Although the Colts had, an, they had a number of prominent black players, they just didn't hang out with their white te teammates outside of the game. And the high cost of a bad image. This is really a, uh, a headline from the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper a few months before the uh, Orioles traded for uh, Frank Robinson. The Orioles image, again, was having black players but not having any star black players. Bob Boyd was probably the best of the Oriole players before Frank Robinson shows, shows up, black players. Dave Popes, the first Oriole, first black to play for the Orioles. Lenny Green, Connie Johnson, Fred Valentine. They were good, but they weren't of star caliber. The Colts, however, they had had black stars through, at least through 1965. They had black stars even beyond 1965, but I'm putting 1965 there because in 66 is when Frank Robinson shows up. They had guys like Buddy Young, John Mackey, Lenny Moore, Mel Embry, George Taliaferro. In fact, George Taliaferro, he was on the original Colts team in, 1950, in 1953. And most, most, if not all of these guys are in the NFL Hall of Fame in, in Canton. In, by 1966, Paul Blair and Sam Bowens are on the team, and now they're being and now they're being joined by Frank Thomas. I mean, by I'm sorry, by Frank Robinson. In December of 1965, this is Harry Dalton's first trade. He's been he's been named the uh, general manager, and uh, Lee McPhail has been pushed up to management. And, you know, Harry Dalton becomes the architect of the great Oriole teams. Now, Bill DeWitt, the Reds GM, he, was a, he suggested that Robinson was not a young 30, and Robinson himself may have considered himself an old 30. Robinson won the 1956 National League Rookie of the Year, great year, and he also won the 1961 National League MVP. He was considered difficult, however. What does that difficult mean? Well, he was arrested for brandishing a gun uh, during a, uh, a nighttime, uh, a late night dinner in Cincinnati in 1960. Apparently his relationship with Red's upper manager was pretty good before that, but after that he was considered difficult. Bill DeWitt had said that, you know, if you, you know, Robinson had a very good year in 65. It wasn't like he had a lousy year. 
I think Bill DeWitt was under the, maybe was under the adage, well, you, you know, you know, you, you can't trade, you know, you, tr you can trade a guy a year too soon, but not a year too late. That's what Brent, Branch Rickey had said. He wanted pitching and he got Mill Pappas, who was a stalwart pitcher for the Orioles in the 60s. He had made, he made some all-star teams, got Jack Balson who the Orioles just does, got from the Phillies and Jack Balson was a solid relief pitcher. And he got Dick Simpson, a fellow who the Angels had thought was going to be a star at some point. And that, and they had just traded Norm Seaburn for uh, the Orioles just traded Norm Norm Seaburn for him. Now there are previous issues. When I say previous issues, it turns out the previous issues are mostly of what I could find of National League players having issues in in spring training and beyond. Frank Robbins had issues in spring training when he was playing with the Reds in Tampa. He couldn't. He couldn't go to, you know, he could go to the dog track, but he had to sit pretty far away from the action. Couldn't go to highlight, couldn't go to movies, couldn't play golf or bowling. And what really affected him was not being, he loved, he loved to go to the movies. Henry Aaron, Wes Covington, Billy Bruden, when they were playing for the Braves and uh, they were working out in, uh, in, in uh, Bradenton, they had to live in what they called an adequate boarding house. Well, you know, the white players were living in much, much better housing. And back to Frank Robinson, he had to live with two other uh, players uh, in a boarding house that just had a, uh, a bathtub and no uh, shower. Now, Bill White, who later become outspoken, but he, was, he spoke out about segregated housing in St. Pete during spring trading, and Martin Luther King thanked him for that. Bob Gibson had spoken about so, manager Sally Hemus' ra racism with the Cardinals. And Dick Allen dealt with overt racism in Little Rock in 1963. That, that, that was a presentation. Somebody made a presentation that a few years ago at the Sabre Convention. He was the first black to play in Little Rock. Racism in 1964 in Philadelphia. And that was during his great rookie season. And then he had to deal with racism again with his fight with Frank Thomas in 1965 where Frank Thomas, an altercation, uh, Frank Thomas hit uh, Allen over the shoulder with a bat. The Phillies uh, got rid of Frank D Thomas uh, a few days later, and Dick Allen was told not to speak to the press. Well, the theory was if he wasn't speaking to the press, most people thought it was Dick Allen's fault. In 1966, in spring training, Frank Robinson's wife was searching for, but was not able to obtain housing in Baltimore. She had come in from the West Coast. She was looking for rental housing. In fact, one woman said, well, if you were Mrs. Brooks Robinson, we could give you a, rent, a rental house. Frank called up from uh, spring training to Gerald Hofberger, the Orioles owner, and said, listen, I'm coming up. And if we don't get, if I don't get housing in the next few days, I'm just not going to play. I don't know how, I don't know how uh, serious he was, but Gerald Hopper said, listen, give me a couple days and we'll find you housing. He had an associate from National Bohemian Beer, which he, he, he owned as well, to, to locate housing for Robinson in, a, in, the, in Ashburton, which is a uh, part of Baltimore. But Robinson still, he chafed at still not being allowed in some restaurant shops and bars. Bob Lukey, the author of Integrating the Orioles Baseball and Race Relations in Baltimore said, he said that a, a management said, look, we handle everyone the same here. Rest assured, you won't be treated differently. L Luke said that was the first definitive outreach to a black player by Orioles management. Now the picture on the right shows that, the photo shows this is after the Orioles have won the uh, American League pennant. It's, it's late September, and you see there are signs there, welcome World Series, uh, you know, welcome World Series and uh, welcome pennant, pennant winners, pennant winners. And you're enter, entering Robinson Road. Mayor Theodore McKeldin uh, changed the name of the street to Robinson Road, and everything looks hun hunky-dory here. Well, you know, uh, I don't think we don't think everything changed in, in, that hap, in that half year. A lot of things changed, but not, not everything. Um, 
now what we're going to do is we're going to try to really talk about we're gonna, I'm going to talk about A.L. Black performance from 1947 to 1975. 47, the start of Jackie Robinson's uh, career in the major leagues through 1975 when Frank Robinson uh, uh, retires from playing ba baseball. He's still a manager. There are 44 instances of black players in the American League who finished in the top 10 of wins above replacement from 1947 through 1975. At the same time, were 107 instances. And there were only 12 individual black all-stars in the American League from 1960 through 1965. That was accounting for nine all-star games because of the, of course, there were the two all-star games apiece from 60 through 62 in, the, uh, in, in that decade. And Dick Allen, just, just to point out, he becomes the second black player in the American League, in the National League to come over to the American League uh, in 1972 to win the MVP. And it's a very, you know, the coincidences are very, very interesting. The um, Frank Robinson had been traded to the Dodgers from the Orioles at the end of the 71 season. He wanted to go out back out West. He was from there from the, at the coast, on the coast. And literally around the same time, he gets traded to the uh, uh, Dodgers, and Dick Allen is traded from the Dodgers to the White Sox for Tommy John. So before, before and including, before 1966, the most high-profile black player in the Orioles was probably Bob Boyd. From 66 on, Frank Robinson and the Orioles would not be the same competitive, competitively and by racial makeup. By 68, Dave May, Elrod Hendricks, and Don Buford would join Robinson, Paul Blair, Kurt Modden, and Fred Valentine, the seven blacks in the 68 roster. Also, by this time, the Orioles were having, uh, they would invite, uh, uh, they would invite uh, black little, little leaguers to come to Memorial uh, Stadium and they would, uh, the, the black players would actually uh, Work, work out with them and they would sign balls and then they would, they would, you know, they would, they would show them uh, different ba ba baseball skills. And this was a, really the start of the Orioles outreach to the uh, black kids as well as the, you know, as well as the Oriole, the black fans as, as a whole. And by the 70s, we see some black stars of the Orioles. I must admit, Earl Williams was really a black star of the Braves. And he, you know, when the Orioles got him, he wasn't quite as, quite as good, but he was, you know, that rookie year in 71, he was a, a star. But they had, they had really decided that they were going, you know, they, they went in deep. And sure enough, they were competitive. They were competitive through, through 1983. In 1966, Frank Robinson and Earl Wilson each had wars of 7.7. .7. Because of something... Uh, baseball reference Earl Earl Wilson. I mean Earl Wilson uh, had a, his war is, slight, is is ranked higher than Frank's, but they're both really similar in war. But we'll tell you that Frank Robinson's offensive numbers just dwarfed uh, every, everybody else, you know. And we know he hit he hit the forty nine home runs, had over one hundred twenty runs batting. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because those were the numbers that that people went with, you know, he won the uh, Triple Crown that, that year. He was a hard-nosed player, and he was a person to deal with racism throughout his time in Cincinnati and Baltimore. Was it more than other players? I don't know. That's not really the question. He played well, but he still had to deal with external issues that just that the white players, if they didn't have to think about it, they just didn't have to uh, deal with. So just to show you, we can see for the war for the AL black players and really starts in 1950 through 75 for the American League. You see that from 50 through 59, we have two, Doby and Minoso. Then we start a little bit more. We have Howard, Oliva, Versailles, Buf Buford, Oliva. By 66, we now up to four. We have Wilson and Ro Robinson who are essentially tied and then AG and Oliva. And that, you know, it, 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 it goes up, it goes up, you know, it goes up by, you know, by 1970, we're, uh, we're, we're back to four. So we have, we have really, we, you know, now we see that we have black, black players are being, you know, 
that the, Amer the American League, in fact, even has uh, really great black players. And in 67, Frank Robinson was still in the top 10. And in 69, he was in the top 10. Now, we look at the Baltimore Orioles standings. Well, before he shows up, the Orioles are good. They're good. You know, they, they, average, uh, they're, they average about being average standing close to fourth, fourth place, average games behind 12.3, 12 and their winning, average winning percentage is 546. But, you know, in, um, they, they've had you know, 60, 61, and 64, and 65 are, are pretty good years, but they needed that one person to put them over the top. From 66 through 71, you see that their, you know, the average standing is 2.1, and the average game behind is 5.5, and average one loss percentage is 604. And the only reason that, you know, the only reason they even have that, as, you know, the, uh, you know, standing of about two, two, you know, second place and average game behind 5.5 is because of the anomaly in 1967. And part of the thing was that Frank Robinson had, had gotten hurt. Um, and then from uh, 72 through uh, 75, um, the last line, the, uh, 72 through 75, it's a 560 winning percentage, 2.3 um, games behind, and, and the average, you know, the standing is 1.7, 1, 1 but they don't win the uh, pennant in any of those years. Hey, Mark, just want to just give you a heads up. You got about 10 minutes total left. Oh, total. All right. We're, all right, fine. So in uh, Orioles attendance, the highest rank they had from in their glory years from 66 to 83 when they won a total of uh, uh, six pennants, three world championships, the highest rank was that first was that first world championship year in 66 when they ranked third. They just didn't have high attendance for those 18 seasons. They would not have high attendance figures until they went into Oriole Park at Camden Yards in 1992. Now, we're going to bring this all together here in the, you know, now, this year. Freddie Gray, I don't know if you remember, Freddie Gray was held in police detention in 2015, I believe in April 2015. He was, uh, he died in, in, uh, in police custody. And during that time, the Orioles were playing the White Sox in a series. So the Orioles played the White Sox in a game in front of no fans. And of course, we have the protests now, and we have COVID now that uh, we probably, if there are games played, will, games will probably, they won't be played in front of any fans. And then we also have now the discussion about renaming the MVP awards to the Frank Robinson awards, because he's the only one to have won in both, in both leagues. So the Orioles fortunes changed on and off the field when they acquired Frank. Robinson. His baseball ex exploits and the effects of the trade had positive outcomes in the team's racial composition, their competitiveness, and the relationship with the Black community. Thank you. Let me, uh... All right. So just a reminder, anybody who has questions for Mark, go ahead and put those in the chat. We'll use the chat to take all questions. There was one comment uh, during this that I wanted to that I wanted to bring up, Mark. Um, the Steve uh, Steve says his understanding was that the Robinson Pappas trade was largely negotiated by McPhail, though closed by Dalton after he had taken over as GM. All right, I all right. If uh, you know if, if if he can send me that info, that would be. That would be great. It's funny that what I had read was um, that people really had thanked, you know, had really had it was Dalton, but you know, well, it, it was his, his first trade, so he may be right. <laughs> you know, I can't. Uh, <laughs> no, under understood. He might be, you uh, know, but what I had read was that they gave a lot of the uh, the emphasis on Dalton, but you know, it you know it may it, it might make sense that it is McPhail. <laughs> uh, uh, Mark asks, uh, did Robinson initiate the kangaroo court or did he bring it from Cincinnati? You know, I, I didn't, um, that's a one thing I didn't focus on. So I'll have to go look at that. 
but I know that he was the, that was important for the team as well. Uh, Mike asks, what was the reaction of the fans when Robinson was traded away? I think it was, I don't think the fans were happy about it. And I, but I think they didn't understand who, who initiated the move. As I understand, it was Robinson who wanted to get back west because he was originally from Oakland and he lived, I believe he lived in Southern California. And remember, when his wife comes east, she's not looking to buy housing. She's looking to rent. And he really wanted to get back there. So I think they were, I almost think the Orioles were forced into it because I, if I remember the trade, I don't know who else they got, but Doyle Alexander was the key trade. I so I have to go back and really look about that. I, I, I hadn't really focused on that. Gotcha. Uh, so Roger, who uh, admits to being from Cincinnati, asks, why Pappas in the trade instead of Palmer, McNally, or other pitchers? Well, I think Palmer was hurt. I think Palmer had been hurt. I think, uh, you know, I think Palmer had, you know, and I think he had been hurt, and I think he would be hurt again. I don't know about McNally and the others, and who knows, maybe – Maybe they knew something about Pappas. Although Pappas, you know, it's funny. Pappas had thrown a lot of innings, but he was only 20, 26 years old. And he really was a solid pitcher. And, you know, if you read up on it, at the time the trade was made, it, the Reds weren't vilified for it. They said the Reds got, got pitching. They really needed pitching. I just think maybe they traded they – maybe they could have traded some, somebody else that, as opposed to, to Robinson. <laughs> Uh, DSM asks, did the Orioles do anything tangible to identify or address racism within the organization and or community over the course of Robinson's time with the club? Yeah, they, yeah, they, they, well, they did because they were the ones who finally said, we're going to reach out at least racism. Well, we're going to reach out to the black fans. We're going to reach out and we're going to bring the black little, little leaguers in. And we're going to do a lot of that. And they kept adding more and more solid black players. I mean, by, you know, by the 70s, they have some. They, their team, by 68, a thir uh, about a third of the team is, is black already. So I think they've, they've already started to do it. Baltimore was a tough city. I know it's just, it was a, it's just a tough city. I mean, you wouldn't think of it, but it really was, con you know, it was, it was the northernmost southern, southern city. But, you know, they actually, in 66, it's a funny thing, I don't know about the Orioles per se, but I will tell you that Spiro Agnew ran for governor against a Democrat. And the Democrat he ran against was, was very similar to George Wallace. And Spiro Agnew said, we got to stop this. We got to open up every, you know, he was a Republican, but he was a, re, you know, he was, you know, he was a Republican who said, we got to stop the, um, we we have to stop the uh, this uh, seg this segregation. It was the Democrats who were who were keep keeping it going. Uh, you may not have come across this. Is probably we probably only have uh, time for this last question. Alan asks if Pappas was involved because of his role in the players' union. Well, I don't know at the time. We do know that in '68, that's the reason why the Reds traded him to the Braves. You know, he was really involved after uh, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. He was really involved because he wanted to have, I made a presentation about that a few years ago at the convention about uh, games not being played because of what, not because of weather. And it has to do with, and he really was involved with that. He was upset that they didn't come up with a day for uh, mourning for uh, Bobby Kennedy. And sure enough, he was traded a couple a couple weeks later so maybe he was i don't i don't know players union is very new then though in six in 66. right all right well thank you so much mark uh that was excellent thanks for being our leadoff hitter for the entire uh for the entirety of saber virtual and uh and we're gonna we're gonna transition to the next presenter uh john burbridge jr and john i think uh I think you are listed as Alex Jenkins. Is that right? But we need you to we need you to unmute. I'm sorry. 
Okay. All right, we can hear you. Okay, great. Let me Excellent. go share screen. Yeah, and let me uh, let me go ahead and, and introduce you while you uh, while you pull that up, if you don't mind. Okay. All right. Dr. John J. Burbridge Jr. is currently Professor Emeritus at Elon University, where he was both a dean and professor. He is also an adjunct at York College of Pennsylvania. While at Elon, he introduced and taught baseball and statistics. He has authored several Sabre publications and presented at Sabre conventions, nine, and the Seymour meetings. He's a lifelong New York Giants baseball fan. The greatest Giants-Dodgers game he attended was a one nothing Giants victory in Jersey City in 1956. Yes, the Dodgers did play in Jersey City in 1956 and 1957. John can be reached at Burbridge at elon.edu. John, take it away. Okay, thank you, Scott. As Scott indicated, I'm a native of Jersey City and a uh, New York Giant fan, but I was surrounded by Yankee fans in Jersey City. In fact, I don't know whether I dislike the Yankees or the Yankee fans, but Honey Kafiro, who lived across the street from me, he would try to convince me that Charlie Silvera was the second best catcher in the major leagues in the early 1950s. He was Yogi's backup, better than Campanella or Wes Westrom. Now, you ask, why am I including Westrom in that group? Well, I'm a Giant fan, and Westrom was a great defensive catcher, hit a lot of home runs, and also check out his on-base percentage. In 1985, I, we moved to Baltimore, and I was looking forward to going to 33rd Street and see the Yankees get beat by the Orioles. And I got some tickets for a September 20th, 1985 game. But before we get to September 20th, let's talk a little bit about the beginning of the season. And the Yankees don't have a very good start to the season. They lose 10 out of their first 16 games and even get beat in Columbus. George Steinbrenner is not a very happy camper. Yogi hasn't, the team hasn't performed in 84 on the Yogi and with this start, he's determined to fire Yogi. And he calls Billy Martin up and says, Billy, would you like to manage the Yankees for the fourth time? Billy says, definitely. George tells Billy to go to Texas, where the Yankees will be heading after their series in Chicago. But now he's got a fire yogi. And he sends Clyde King out to Chicago. And after their third loss in Chicago, Clyde meets Yogi in the, club, in the clubhouse and tells him, Yogi, uh, you're no, no longer going to be the manager of the Yankees. And of course, Yogi's not very happy. But later on, it becomes known that he's really, really ticked at the fact that George didn't do it in person. And that begins the Yogi Steinbrenner feud, which only ends when Steinbrenner goes to his museum in Montclair, New Jersey. As usual, the Yankees improve under Billy Martin. Uh, Billy's teams, whether they be in Minnesota, Detroit, Texas, or Oakland, or his previous three stints with the Yankees, all played well. And Billy's known for his aggressive play. In fact, it's coined Billy Ball. And when he was coaching with managing the Oakland, he really lets Ron, Henderson run all over the field. And in fact, is big at stealing home. And he gets his players involved in really, really moving on the bases and, and getting an extra base and, and stealing. Billy Ball, small ball. But Billy's also famous for his on-field and off-field balls. One of his on-field balls is when he's with second baseman for the Cincinnati Reds, and Jim Brewer throws a few bean balls at him. Martin challenges Brewer on the mound and really pummels him and causes some significant damage, and Brewer ends up actually suing Martin after that. And of course, how can we forget the marshmallow salesman, Joe Cooper in Minnesota? And then today, Horseye Trivia answer was Clint Courtney. Martin had a few brawls with Clint Courtney. And of course, the last one I'll refer to is Dave Boswell. And I refer to Dave because Dave is a Baltimore native and actually went to Calvador High School. And he was pitching for Minnesota and Martin was the manager. And Martin beats him up. 
So Billy is really famous for these on-field and off-field brawls, and there are a few I didn't, haven't even mentioned. For instance, Jimmy Pearsall. Billy's not happy as the Yankees head to Baltimore on September 20th. They have had a seven-game losing streak. They've lost three to Toronto, one to the Indians, and three to the Tigers. They've been chasing the Toronto Blue Jays all season. And before this losing streak, they were like a game or two out, but end up in Baltimore six and a half games out. And now we go to the second protagonist, Eddie Lee Whitson. Eddie Lee is a Tennessee native, great high school pitcher in Tennessee. He went 14 and eight with an ERA of 3.24, pitching for the 1984 pennant winning Padres. He, in, he actually goes from Pittsburgh. He makes his debut in Pittsburgh, gets traded to the San Francisco Giants, and then ends up with the Indians before San Diego. He actually gets traded to, uh, from, to the Indians for Dwayne Kuyper, and that's how Dwayne Kuyper ends up with the Giants. Um, but Whitson had an excellent year in 84, and he's probably best known for his stint in the National League Championship Series. San Diego is playing the Cubs, and their first two games are in Chicago, and they get beat up pretty badly. And they're heading to San Diego for three games. They have to sweep in order to get to the series. And who do they call upon game three but Eddie Lee Whitson? And Whitson beats the Cubs seven to one. The series turns. Padres win games four and five and end up in the tight with playing against the Tigers in the World Series. Eddie Lee gets a start in the World Series, but he doesn't pitch for long. 17 pitches. He doesn't get out of the first inning. But he had a good year in 1984. He's going to be a free agent. And he's able to parlay that year and get a nice contract with the Yankees. Uh, 4.4 million over a five year period. 1985 is not necessarily a good year for Eddie Lee. He begins the season losing six of his first seven games. And with that, he's not showing the promise a $4.4 million pitcher should be producing. And the Yankee fans really get on him. A lot of cat calls, boos. In fact, they start throwing things at him. Uh, his overall record ends up being 10 to 8 as he comes back and pitches fairly decently in the summer months, goes into a little slump at the end of August, getting into September, his ERA is rather disappointing, 4.88. Uh, on one occasion in 1985, in a, in a story that Murray Chast produced in 1986 in the New York Times, uh, Eddie Lee was followed out of Yankee Stadium after he had gotten uh, beat up pretty badly pitching. He is followed by a carload of Yankee fans as he goes to the Yankee George Washington Bridge, and this unnerves Whitson. So it, it's been a rather rough year for Eddie Lee in 1985. Uh, I want to add also that Eddie Lee is six foot three, 195 pounds, and he's skilled in the martial arts. And he's also known for his pugilistic abilities. When he was with the Giants, Roger Metzger, a reserve shortstop with the Giants, was trying to teach. Eddie Lee had a bunt, and Eddie Lee was taking exception to whatever Metzger was telling, telling him. And this, this little argument ensues into the clubhouse, and Whitson says, I had enough, punches Metzger, knocks him cold for five seconds. So here we have both Billy Martin and Eddie Lee Whitson, both having pugilistic abilities. Now let's go to the primary locale for this weekend. And it's not Memorial Stadium at 33rd Street, although they do play the games there. It's the Cross Keys Inn, which is part of the village at Cross Keys, which was designed and developed by Jim Rouse. Jim Rouse is a legendary urban developer. He's responsible for Columbia, Maryland, the Inner Harbor in Baltimore, Faneuil Hall, and several other urban development projects. He's also quite a philanthropist. The Cross Keys Inn is part of the Cross Keys Village, which is also composed of stores, shops, and condos. For those of you who know Baltimore, it's on Falls Road in northern Baltimore City, just south of Northern Parkway, not far from Pimlico Racetrack, home of the Freakness. In the 1984-1985 season, uh, off-season, 
Bill, Cal Bill Killacane, who's the Yankee traveling secretary, stays at the Korski's, and he's quite impressed by the bucolic setting here in northern Baltimore City. And he decides that this would be a good place for the Yankees to stay during the season when they play the Orioles. Possibly to keep them away from downtown Baltimore and the notorious street in downtown Baltimore. But maybe because it's actually closer to 33rd Street and Memorial Stadium, since it is in northern Baltimore City. The Korski's Inn is still functioning today as part of the Delta Hotels by Marriott. Okay, let's now continue our little story here, and let's go to the Yankee Clubhouse on the evening of September 20th, 1985. And A. Lee Whitson enters the clubhouse, and he immediately becomes somewhat disappointed because he sees he's not going to start that Friday night game. He's being bypassed by a rich body. He thinks it's his normal turn. In fact, he had pitched the previous Sunday in New in New York, and so this Friday would be his normal turn in the rotation. And he hears that there's some rumor that he's got a bad arm. Well, he immediately goes around and tries to dispel that rumor. But maybe Martin is bypassing Whitson because uh, the previous Sunday, he actually only went two innings, gave up seven hits and four runs against the Toronto Blue Days. The previous start, he went seven innings, but he gave up 12 hits and six runs against the Milwaukee Brewers. He actually did win that game. Woodson's displeasure is obvious to everyone in the clubhouse, but he's not finding many, much sympathy since Eddie is a bit of a loner on this Yankee team. The Orioles win the game behind Flanagan with Don Arce getting the save. By the way, Bordy doesn't pitch badly but still not as effective as he could. Uh, so the Yankees lost this one. They have now lost eight in a row. So off to the cross keys in, the Yankees go, obviously not very happy. When they reach the cross keys in, Martin, some coaches, a few players, some of the press gravitate the cross keys bar. And as I said, Martin is not in a good frame of mind as he enters the bar. But what does he find in the bar? He finds a rather festive occasion. There's a wedding party having a good old time. Martin becomes rather gregarious and buys the wedding party a bottle of champagne and supposedly even dances with the bride. Uh, after the wild bridal party leaves, say like one o'clock in the morning, uh, the groom comes back to the bar a few minutes later and he says to Billy, Billy, I just was talking to my wife. She said that you told her she had a pot belly. Martin looked at the groom and said, no, I never said anything of the sort. We well, see that lady over there at the bar. I did say she had a fat ass. Now Martin has ticked off the groom, the lady with the fat ass, and the guy with the lady. Uh, but cooler heads prevail, no punches are thrown. And Billy ends up going to bed, awaiting the sun Saturday afternoon game. Killer Kane is a, obviously, uh, apparently, uh, a conduit back to George in New York, and he recounts what's happened to the bar in the bar uh, to Steinbrenner. And Steinbrenner says, "Whatever happened to that one o'clock curfew that I instituted before day games?" Eureka! The losing streak ends on Saturday. The Yankees win five to two. They win behind Joe Kelly with Brian Fisher getting save. Storm Davis was the losing pitcher for the Orioles. And Ron Hassey and Ken Griffey Jr., excuse me, Ken Griffey Sr. hit home runs for the Yankees. So back to they go to the Cross Keys Inn, and they're in a much happier frame of mind on, on Saturday afternoon. Bill Pennington, who's the Yankee beat writer for the Bergen Record, and also the author of Billy Martin, Floor Genius. If you want to read more about Billy Martin and also this weekend, that's a great book to get. Bill Pennington, Billy Martin, Floor Genius. Um, Pennington goes to the bar in the cross keys in, and who's there but Eddie Lee Whitson. And Eddie Lee is nursing a bud. And he tells Pennington all about the previous night activity. Uh, Pennington leaves, 
Uh, we don't know whether Whitson ever left because he's obviously going to be drinking a bit more. Uh, Martin and his entourage, they head down to his favorite crab house in Baltimore. I'm not sure which one that was, but he has a favorite. And a little later, uh, Lou Pinella and Killer Kane, they go down to Little Italy for dinner. Uh, after dinner, Martin comes back to the hotel, and he and his entourage head down to the bar once again. And Eddie Lee is there. And Eddie Lee is agitated and speaking loudly. He's obviously had a few more buds. And he's telling everyone in the bar that Billy Martin is ruining his career. Uh, Dale Berry's wife, Lee Berry, comes back and she tries to soothe Eddie Lee to no avail. Uh, Eddie Lee has Albert Millis. Albert Millis is a Yankee fan from Binghamton, New York. And he's standing next to Eddie Lee. And they have some words, and Eddie Lee immediately starts accusing Millis of eavesdropping. Uh, Billy is sitting at the bar, and he sees all of this in the mirror behind the bar, and he decides, I'm going to act as a peacemaker. So Martin comes back and tells Billy, uh, excuse me, tells Eddie, you're drunk, Eddie. You don't need this. Well, it's the wrong thing to say to Eddie Lee Whitson. Eddie punches Martin and also levels a few kicks and gets Martin in the forearms. After about 20 seconds, they're eventually separated and they drag Eddie Lee into the lobby of the Cross Keys Inn. Billy is still acting as a peacemaker and he follows the group into the lobby and continues to try to soothe down, soothe Eddie Lee and calm him down. Uh, Whitson has his arms pinned by the Yankee personnel, but remember his feet are free and he's skilled in the martial arts. Well, he lets loose a mighty kick and he gets Billy right in the groin, uplifts Billy. Billy is obviously stunned. And when he composes himself, he looks at Whitson and says, no longer a peacemaker, now I'm going to have to kill you. At that point, they drag Whitson out the sliding glass doors into the, lot, into the parking lot of the hotel. The Yankee personnel are attempting to prevent Martin from following Whitson, uh, and they're blocking Martin from going through the sliding glass doors. One individual who's doing this is Ron Hassey, and Hassey continues to block Martin. Martin throws a feint to his right, then a left. Hassey is put out of position, and Martin dashes through the glass doors and jumps into the fray outside. And in the fray outside, Billy ends up on hitting his head on the macadam. Uh, it's obvious now Billy is again stunned outside, and they separate both Billy and Whitson. And as they separate them, a police car enters the park a lot, followed by a taxi cab. And in that taxi cab, there's Lou Pinella and Killer King coming back from dinner at Little Italy. And, and Pinella says, boy, I don't know what, I hope Billy's not involved in this. <laughs> Literally, Literally, no. Uh, they take Whitson into the parking garage, which is at the opposite end of the hotel entrance and put him on the elevator and take him up to the third floor. And Martin is just dragged into the lobby of the hotel and also put on the elevator up to the third floor from the lobby. And guess what? The elevator doors open and there's Martin and Whitson confronting each other again. But they just yell at each other. Uh, no punches are thrown. Martin is put in his room, Whitson's put in his room. Martin is not through though. Uh, in his room, he tells Pinella, who has come up from the lobby with Martin, he tells Pinella to go over to Eddie Lee's room and to tell Eddie Lee to meet him in the parking lot in the next five minutes. Uh, he still wants to fight. I guess what really is kind of bugging Billy, this could be the first fight he's ever lost to another ball player. Uh, Pinella does go to Whitson's room, checks on Whitson, 
and finds out that Eddie Lee is going to be taken up to New Jersey the following morning. So there will be no confrontation at the ballpark on Sunday. Uh, he comes back to Martin's room and finds Billy really kind of hurting. He's hit his head. He's got kicked in the groin. And he's been kicked in the forearms and punched in the forearms. And guess what? That right, right forearm is starting to swell. Uh, Pinella says, maybe we should go to the hospital. Martin says, just wrap it up. But finally, they convince Billy he should go to the hospital. And he goes to Union Memorial Hospital, not far from Korski's Inn, and is diagnosed with a fractured forearm. His arm is put in a cast and in a sling. And you see Billy with a sling, with his sling, possibly entering Memorial Stadium the following day on Sunday. Killer Kane appraises George about everything that's happened. George is amazed. He can't believe the fight went three rounds. First, the ball, then the lobby, and then outside, and almost a fourth round on the third floor. Um, the next day, Martin shows up at the game with his arm in a cast. When asked by a Baltimore TV reporter about the cast, Martin said he heard his arm, he heard his arm bowling. Uh, but then he decides he's got to come clean. So he gets the New York beat writers together before the game and tells them what had happened, putting a lot of emphasis on the fact that he was acting as a peacemaker and it was Eddie Lee's kicks that caused the damage. Martin is asked by one of the reporters whether Whitson is still going to pitch for him. Billy responded, I've always said I would play Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini if they could help me win. So he's opened the door for Whitson to return in the next two weeks of the season. Steinbrenner is told, asked about this event the following day, and he mentioned, he especially, is there going to be any fines or suspensions? And Steinbrenner is quoted as saying, Ed Whitson will not be suspended at this time, nor will Billy. I don't know how I could take action against one without taking action against the other. And yes, there is a game that's played that Sunday. The Yankees win it. The Orioles make it close in the ninth inning. But as it is tumultuous weekend, the Yankees actually bleed Baltimore with a two-game winning streak. The Yankees continue to play better baseball in this next week and a half and go to Toronto for a three-game series. And just what? The last weekend of the series, they're only three games back. So if they can sweep Toronto, they force a playoff, and maybe that Yankee luck will still hold. Uh, and guess who's starting that first Friday night game? Eddie Lee Whitson. So Billy is going to use Eddie Lee once again. And Whitson actually pitches quite admirably for four innings. He only gives up, he only allows one base runner. The Yankees score two runs and lead two to nothing in the bottom of the fifth. But Things go a little bit south for Eddie Lee. And then there's a key error by third baseman Andre Robertson. The Toronto ties the game. Eddie Lee is a little unnerved. Martin takes him out. He goes to the ninth inning. The game goes to the ninth inning. And the Toronto had gotten another run. So they now lead three to two. They've got their ace fireman, Tom Henke, in there. Henke retires the first two batters, but Butch Weiniger hits a home run, ties the game, and then Henke, unnerved, gives up another run, and the Yankees win this game 4-3, to three, and they're really in a happy mood. They can see themselves winning the next two games and forcing a playoff. But unfortunately for the Yankees, Joe Cowley loses the next game on Saturday, and Toronto wins the American East flag. Uh, after the season, uh, George fires Billy once again, but he keeps Billy on as a personal assistant with a fairly good salary. He knows that Mark would be in demand by other teams to manage. Uh, after all, after a six and 10 start, the Yankees won 97 games in 1985. Excellent record. Once again, Martin has turned around the team. During the 86 season, George orchestrates Billy Martin Day. And Billy's number one is retired. 
and he's commemorated in the uh, in the monuments in Center Field. Uh, Billy comes back and manages in 1988, but once again, midway through the season, he has a little bit of an episode at a men's club in Dallas. He gets fired again. Uh, amazingly, Whitson stays with the Yankees until 1986. They can't trade him in the offseason, given that $4.4 million contract. But during the offseason, the Yankees eat his salary and trade him to San Diego for Tim Stoddard. Uh, visiting teams now stay downtown since the opening of Camden Yards. I don't know if anybody actually stayed at the Inn at Cross Keys or Cross Keys Inn after the 1985 season, but certainly downtown is the desired location now. Uh, and of course, in a tragic accident on Christmas Day in 1989, Billy Martin is killed. Uh, the irony of that is Billy and his friend Bill Reedy and their wives were supposed to be in New York on Christmas Day, but Billy's wife Jill gets sick. Uh, Bill Reedy and Billy go out, run some errands on Christmas Day and see a restaurant and bar that's open and go to that bar, come back, a little close before six o'clock, make a left turn into his driveway, hit a ditch and then a stone wall. Billy breaks his neck and is killed. Let me just finish up by digressing a little bit about Billy and his managerial ability. Uh, he's John, John just, a, just a heads up here, John, we're, uh, we got about three minutes left in, in uh, total. I will not need those three minutes. Okay. Uh, he, well, if there's some questions, yes. Okay, let me just finish up quickly. Uh, Billy, Billy, the Elias Sports View Bureau did a study of managers and say that Billy is probably the most impactful manager in the history of baseball. Um, I guess if I was a general manager and I had a game to win, a series to win, or half a season to where I wanted to lead the league, maybe I'd call on Billy, uh, but probably not over a season or a long run because of his ability to self-destruct. Thank you very, very much. Questions and comments. Yeah, anybody who's got anybody questions, got go questions. ahead and uh, enter those in the chat for us. All right, here we go. Um, from Jim, how about the incident when Whitson gets a death threat before his start at Shea Stadium in 1987? Uh, Okay, I'm going to have to beg forgiveness on that one. I'm not necessarily that familiar. I'm going to have to call on any of my Met fans in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do remember reading something about that, but I can't recollect exactly what it was. So we've got we've got a, a bit of a comment here from uh, from Bridget, uh, where Billy. Billy made a cameo in the 80s sitcom, Who's the Boss? And in that cameo, he actually had a speaking role and his arm was in a sling. Uh, and she, she speculates that it, was, it would have maybe been filmed uh, in the aftermath of, uh, of this fight. Could have been, yeah. That's certainly possible. Of course, you know, he and uh, Steinbrenner always did those Miller Lite commercials too. They were always kind of humorous when Miller Lite first came out. That's right. Uh, we'll take this as the last question here. Steven says, what did Eddie's teammates on the Yankees think of him? What was their reaction to the brawl? Uh, I guess by that time, let's face it, Billy was kind of predictable for getting into these activities. And as I said, there was no love for Eddie Lee Whitson. Eddie Lee was kind of a country boy. He was from Tennessee. The only individual on the Yankees he apparently tried to get involved or attached was Ron Guidry, who was also from Louisiana. But Guidry was a little bit of a loner too. So there was really no great sympathy. And I'm guessing that maybe they sympathized with Martin as a result of this, because really to some extent, it was Eddie Lee mouthing off in the bar uh, after dinner that precipitated the whole thing. And um, so uh, I don't necessarily think there was any great sympathy for Eddie Whitson. Very good. John, thank you so much.
That was excellent. As always, any uh, Billy Martin research sure to be a colorful presentation. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, Paul. You go ahead and unmute yourself, Paul. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. And, sure. uh, and John, if you could stop sharing your screen, then Paul can share his. Okay. There we go. All right, Paul. While you uh, while you pull that up and uh, and start sharing your screen, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, and give you the intro. Uh, Dr. Paul Simonelli was born, grew up, and currently resides in Maryland with his wife Virginia. Paul retired in 2014 as the director of strings at the London School in Bethesda, Maryland. He is currently on the adjunct music faculty of the Rome School of Music, Drama, and Art at the Catholic University of America. His first book, Roy Sievers, The Sweetest Right-Handed Swing in 1950s Baseball, was published by McFarland Books in 2017. His second book, Joe Cambria, Saint or Scoundrel, The Baseball Life of the Washington Senator Super Scout, is currently in production. Okay. Can you see that? Uh, no, I need you to... Uh, so if you're looking at the Zoom on your computer, there should yes. be a green button that says, says share screen. I clicked that, I did. And, and then it, it should ask you to select, uh, select your presentation when you go to do that. Well, I'm sorry, but somehow or other, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. I, I've got it in a different spot. It's all right. Uh, Sorry. why don't you, why don't you stop sharing and see and give it maybe one more try. Do what now? Uh, so if you, if you, if you stop sharing your screen, uh, yes. let's see what happens. I thought I set it up properly by going doing the, the instructions that I got in the sheets from Sabre. Sure. Yeah. I, we'll we'll get this sorted out. Shouldn't shouldn't be too difficult. Um, so why why don't you uh, let's you see. see anything there now? No. Um, when you click share screen, does anything pop up for you? Just a second. I'll go back to share the screen. No, no. I go to share the screen. I got Dropbox, OneDrive, Google Drive, something else I can't see. Okay. It says so share I, down at the bottom. Yep. So I think I think I know what the issue is. If you if you could do this for me, I think you had the present. I'm guessing that the presentation was open before uh, before you joined Zoom, which is fine. But if you could close the presentation, and then and then reopen it, um, and then you'll click share screen, and it and the presentation itself should pop up, and we'll have you ready to go. Just a second. Close, close the file. There's... Okay, I did that. And then go ahead and reopen the file. Okay, here. Uh, it says Zoom package, Zoom install, Cambria PowerPoint. Is that it? Well, your your uh, your PowerPoint presentation. Did you reopen that? That's yes, what I, I was. I just I just did. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So so now uh, go ahead and click the share screen button. And does it does it give you the PowerPoint presentation as an option this time? Uh, my PowerPoint is up, but I don't see it sharing on the screen. Right. I'm sorry. Does that do anything? No, so did it, 
when you clicked shared screen, did it not give you the option to uh, click the presentation? No, it does not. Okay, that's all right. Um, are you, uh, would you be able to email it to me right now? I could go ahead and, uh, and pull it up from here and, and uh, you could walk us through it. Actually, I'd have difficulty doing that. It's too big a file to send you in an email. Okay. I can just continue on if you'd like. Yeah, that's, uh, if, if you're comfortable with that, that's fine. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. That's all right. The technical issues. Uh, sorry, folks. Um, I'm a little technically challenged. I thought I did the right thing, but it's not doing what I thought it was supposed to do. Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, well, I'll get started anyway. And if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask me. Um, thanks, oh, Scott. Hey, so, sorry, well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you one more thing. I think I think we might uh, we might have two different things here. So first. Were, when you were clicking share screen, were you doing that from Zoom or from PowerPoint? No, I'm, I'm, I'm in Zoom looking at you now. Okay, right. And that's where you clicked share screen. Okay. I um, shared screen. I get Dropbox, OneDrive, Google Drive, and Box. Gotcha. Then it, okay. Then at the bottom, it says share. Got it. Okay. All right. Yeah. You uh, just go ahead and keep, keep on going. I... Uh, I'm going to see if we have it in the Dropbox. You go ahead. I won't interrupt. OK. So sorry. Thanks, anyway, for giving me the opportunity, Scott. I appreciate it. And um, good evening, everyone. I'd like to talk with you about Joe Cambria, uh, an influential, sort of obscure, yet a controversial figure in baseball history. Joe was sort of responsible for the uh, pre-integration of baseball in the 1930s with his uh, scouting and hiring of dark-skinned Cuban players for the Washington Senators. But, but more than that, he was an incurable baseball fan and a lover of money. And um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about his life. Uh, Joe Cambria was born Giovanni Carlo Cambria on 5 July, uh, 1890. And he came to the United States with his parents and siblings in, in uh, 1990, uh, 1893. Um, I'm going to compress things down for time so that uh, I get to the end so we can talk about what we're doing. Uh, he attended public schools in around the Lowell, Massachusetts area. He didn't settle in the North End like most of the Italians did in Boston at the time. And he caught the baseball bug early. He played on sand lines as early as 13 years old, and he was playing in, in semi-pro ball by the time he was 15. He played with the Newport Trojans in 1919 and 10, and in 1911 and 12, he played in Canada in the Canadian League with the Ontario Green Sox. It was there in 1912 that he broke his leg and was out of baseball, unfortunately. <clears throat> After baseball, he settled in Baltimore, Maryland, where he bought his first company called the Bugle Coat and Apron Supply Company in downtown Baltimore in 1918. He and his wife Charlotte ran the business and um, he sold it from in 1938 and the business did very, very well. I'll get into that in just a little, a little while. <clears throat> his first foray into managing baseball teams came in 1928 where he took control of a, a, a semi-pro league team called the Homesteads and renamed it the Bugle Nine um, in honor of his, his uh, business, the Bugle Coat and Apron Company. The team did well, he did well, and the Bugle Nine became his first springboard <clears throat> when he bought his first uh, club in 1929. His first professional club was the Hagerstown Hubs in the old Blue Ridge League in Hagerstown, Maryland. He bought it for $2,500 and eventually sold it for $6,500, which was a huge amount of money at that time. He began a business model at that time 
which what served as his model for most of the teams that he had, and he had teams in every classification. His business model was to keep costs low, pay little or nothing for talent, sell talent when the opportunity arose, build the franchise at the gate, sell out or relocate and if things got bad, and he rarely kept a team for longer than five or six years. He installed lights in the Hagerstown field for night games five years before MLB. <clears throat> and when the other owners complained that they lost money during the depression of 29, Joe actually wound up only losing about $4,000 that year. And he was given a standing ovation at the winter meetings. <clears throat> the big thing about Joe was that he always had an affinity for helping young players. And in this quote from <clears throat> the Hagerstown said, he, son, he said, I have been lucky in Baltimore along with plenty of hard work. I get all my fun out of sports, particularly baseball, and I would like to give some of it to young chaps to lift them up and to get a lift that I didn't get. Unless I thought that buying the Hagerstown franchise would be a benefit to the Blue Ridge League and baseball in Baltimore, I wouldn't consider the purchase. <clears throat> I'd like to skip down a little bit. And since our topic is about Baltimore and about um, Baltimore and Washington and its effect on baseball at the time, I'd like to talk about the things that Joe did for Baltimore while he was here. <clears throat> like he said, he bought the, the Bugle Coat and Apron Supply Company in 1918. Bugle Coat and Apron became the largest um, uh, employer, uh, one of the largest employers in downtown Baltimore uh, during that time. They were the leading company for laundry and supply of all the restaurants, hotels, boarding houses, any place that needed any kind of table linen or uh, any kind of waiters aprons or cooking aprons at the time. Uh, it was a very profitable business and they did very well. He, bought, he had the Bugle baseball team in 1928, which became the talk of the semi-pro leagues for several years, and they won semi-pro championships many years. He bought the Hager Sound Hubs in 1929, uh, and, and they did well, and he used Hager Sound, he, uh, actually he used the Bugle team as a jumping off point for Hager Sound, shuttling players back and forth, and in some instances, elevating players from the Sandlots to Hager Sound. In 1931, he started a basketball league and had a basketball team uh, in Hagerstown. Can we all see the screen now? Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I'm sharing. I'm sharing my screen. I got. To, I grabbed your presentation from the from the Dropbox there. So uh, go down to slide. Know? Go down to slide 20, please. I can do that. There you go. <clears throat> the Bugle basketball team in 1931, and he started having uh, 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 interleague semi-pro basketball games in 31. <clears throat> he promoted boxing, football, wrestling, and soccer throughout the, the, uh, the city. And he was one of the, uh, in between 19, 20, 1931 and 1935, he was one of the top boxing promoters in Baltimore. And that was a big deal in Baltimore. They loved boxing in Baltimore. He was also the first president of the Iceland Hockey League in 1931. Carlin's Amusement Park started a hockey league when they uh, took their dance floor and turned it into an ice rink. And the original Baltimore Orioles uh, hockey team played at Carlin's Park. They were a semi-pro team. He was the owner of the Baltimore Black Sox from 32 to 34. And he was over the owner of the Salisbury Indians from 37 to 1940. <laughs> So he was instrumental in uh, developing, in player development throughout the Baltimore area. He was also very uh, instrumental with Jack Dunn and the International League Baltimore Orioles, swapping players and getting players in between them, especially when Joe bought the, the Albany Senators, uh, which were affiliated with the Washington Senators at the time. He bought that team in 1934. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, he was shuttling players between the Orioles and the Albany team uh, because it was a, a high double A uh, team at the time. Uh, next slide. 
Joe's contributions to Washington were that he developed his first walk, working relationship with Clark Griffith when he had the Hagerstown Hubs in 1931. And from 31 until 40 and beyond 1940, actually until 1946, <clears throat> he developed Clark Griffith's farm team, farm system. Uh, up until that time, Griffith only had uh, the Chattanooga Lookouts and the Senators. And uh, it was the only way he could develop players was down in Chattanooga and trying to get up and coming rookies and maybe old stars at the time. But it was Cambria who convinced them that they needed to have a working farm uh, system. And so in 33, that's when he bought the Albany Senators. In 39, uh, Springfield, Greenville in 38, uh, Youngstown, Ohio Senators and the Havana Cubans. Uh, his Class D teams were the Hubs, York Roses, the Salisbury Indians and St. Augustine Saints. <clears throat> And the other thing that was extremely important that Cambria did for uh, the Washington area was that he became a full town scout in 1933 for Cambria. Uh, this occurred when um, Dolph Luque, the great Cuban uh, pitcher, uh, who's in practically every uh, Caribbean or uh, uh, Latin American Baseball Hall of Fame, he, he shut out the Senators to four and a half innings in the deciding game of the 1933 World Series. And um, Griffiths decided, uh, maybe we should look at the Cubans and see if we can't find some decent and cheap talent down there. And so Cambria, starting in 1933 and 34, exclusively started going to Cuba, uh, besides finding some American talent, but mostly Cuban talent. What was very important that he moved the Springfield team from Springfield, Massachusetts to Williamsport in 1944. And that became a one-way conduit for Cuban talent that came directly from Havana all the way to Williamsport. And that became the biggest training ground for his Cuban players at Williamsport between actually 43 and 45. The other thing that was important that Cambria did was he signed, the, the Cuban players were draft exempt because there was a clause in the 1941, I'm, I'm actually having a lawyer look into that for me, but I think it was the 41 or the 42 uh, draft laws that claimed that baseball players were entertainers and they were allowed to have six months draft exempt visas so they could start in April and they could finish the baseball season and they could go a little bit longer, no one really cared, but they were exempt from the draft and um, uh, starting, of course, of course, in 42, a lot of Senators players were leaving to go to the draft, uh, a lot of big name players, and uh, Cambria was able to keep the team competitive and cost efficient during the war years. <clears throat> and the other thing that he did was in the 1950s, his Cuban signers, uh, signees, I'm sorry, like Camilo Pascual, Pedro Ramos, Julio Becker, Jose Valdivieso, Zoyo Vesales, Tony Oliva, uh, all became significant factors uh, in the 1965 uh, Minnesota Twins championships when the first Washington team left to go to Minnesota in uh, 61. So these are the contributions to Cambria uh, within the Baltimore and Washington community. Um, <clears throat> but the, the thing that is uh, 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 disconcerting or contributes about Cambria. Would you go to uh, uh, slide 18, please? <clears throat> Is the good, the bad, and the ugly about Joe Cambria? <clears throat> Joe was really more of a fan than he was a club owner. And he really didn't pay a lot of attention to the rules. And he bent them around and hoped that he didn't get caught but he got caught a lot of times by Judge Landis and was, um, was brought to the carpet on many, many times. And at one particular time, uh, Landis wanted to throw him out of baseball in 1940, but it was Griffith who assaged Landis. Uh, Landis had great compassion and respect for Griffith and only fined him $1,000 at the time and let him stay in the league. But ultimately, it was Landis who ruled in 1940 that minor league owners could, uh, minor league scouts could not own ball teams. 
And so by 1940, Joe was not allowed to physically buy a team or own a team. <clears throat> so some of the things that made Joe controversial was, uh, first of all, the desk contracts. Uh, these were used constantly all the time by Howie Hawk, Sly Slapnicka, and uh, believe it or not, um, uh, uh, Brooklyn, Do uh, uh, Brooklyn Dodgers, uh, um, sorry, uh, the owner of the Dodgers at the time, Jackie Robinson. Desk contracts were basically a blank contract that the player signed and Cambier would throw it in his desk. Uh, if the guy made good, he would take the contract, he'd sign it, he'd pass it along to whoever, whoever he sold it to. If the guy didn't do well, he would lower the price and send him down to a minor league team. He got into trouble for that many, many times. His bad bookkeeping, uh, player strikes, there were several times that the players struck against him because he, he didn't pay them the salary that he was promised. <clears throat> and one of the biggest things uh, that was really controversial about Cambria was that, especially for the Cuban players, they lost their amateur status because of him. Uh, Cambria went down to Cuba and was notorious for signing kids right off of the sandlots. He was reported to have signed almost 400 players to contracts. A lot of these kids were just sandlotters who could hit the ball pretty well. But when they got up to the major leagues, they weren't supposed to be there. The problem was, according to uh, Cuban law, if a player played two years in organized baseball, professional organized baseball, either minor or major leagues, they lost their amateur status in Cuban baseball and could not come back and play for the Elefantes or the Almanderas or any of the Cuban um, um, quote unquote professional teams. They weren't professional, but they were the amateur professional teams. So a lot of players lost their amateur status because they signed contracts with them. That was bad. He, he took advantage of their, their poverty because a lot of these kids were literally making $2.50, $3 a week cutting sugar cane on the plantations. And when you offer a kid $200 to play Major League Baseball, that seems like a fortune to them. And he lured a lot of kids away from uh, Cuba on the pretense of you know, big riches if they made it big in baseball. Uh, another bad thing about Joe was his nepotism. In 1940, when he was uh, banned from, from uh, owning a club, he turned ownership to, of several of his clubs over to his brother, John, who really had very little experience. And John just became a front for Joe to run the team uh, de facto from afar. Uh, his hunger for profit, um, I mean, that goes without saying. It was part of his business model. He, he bought low, he bought teams low, he sold high, he made money, he got good players, he, he, he bought them for practically nothing and sold them to major league teams for big money and he made money. Okay, not, not a bad thing to do, but he may have been a little bit too thirsty for money. <clears throat> the bad things about Joe was that uh, the, the racial hatred in the 30s and 40s, you know, nothing went away when Jackie Robinson came in. And uh, even though he gave these young Cuban kids the opportunity he also, to play baseball, he also showed them what racial hatred and discrimination was like in the United States. The bench chalking was horrible. The bean balling was prevalent, especially with a lot of the, the uh, uh, Cuban players uh, in Washington and uh, Bobby Estelea in particular. Uh, was a little bit adamant about the fact that they went after him a, a lot of a lot of the time. Um, race baiting, fist fights, and the worst thing about it was the ostrac ostracization uh, by his by their own team players and by the people in the cities. Uh, these guys are pretty lonely, and uh, <clears throat> especially in Williamsport, a lot of these guys defected from a lot of these teams and went back home because they were being treated so badly. <clears throat> However. The good thing about Joe was that he really didn't forget the kids that he hired. Um, if you can see my screen, you can see the, the quotes that you have there from Camilo Pascual and Julio Becker. One in particular came from Ralph Avila in 1954. He said, a lot of people resented Cambria because he signed so many players for the Griffiths and so many got released, but I don't. He gave opportunity to, to a lot of my people that no one else was willing to give. And that was the biggest point. 
Becker in particular could not say enough good things about Cambria because Cambria was instrumental in getting his wife, who was a pharmacist and a professional person out of Cuba in 1959, 1960, and got him out from under uh, Castro's power because Castro was not allowing professionals to leave the country when he took over the coup in 1959. But he was able to get his wife and his child uh, out of Cuba at the time and relocated to, to actually it was in, it was in Canada uh, at the time. <clears throat> so uh, next, next slide, please. Slide 19. <clears throat> if, you, if you want to take a look, these are some of the players that, that, that he signed, his American players. And he was responsible for some pretty good players. Mickey Vernon, two-time batting champion, early win, Hall of Fame. Johnny Wella, great pitcher. Eddie Yost, the walking man, one of the highest on-base percentages in baseball history. And of course, those are the, the Cuban players uh, that the Cuban players that made the Washington Senators. Now, there were a lot more that made it up for a cup of coffee, but really didn't stick. Uh, in, in all the years that he was there, approximately 53 Cubans made the actual rosters, the official rosters of the Senators between 1934 and 1960 when they left. Uh, and he still had Cuban players on the team in 1962 when he passed away. <clears throat> He's a controversial guy because he tried desperately to get Griffith to um, uh, 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 integrate the team before Jackie Robinson. He could have had Minnie Minoso before Jackie Robinson. He could have had Roy Campanella before Brooklyn. But uh, Griffith was very, very shy about uh, breaking the, the color, the unwritten rule of the color barrier. He was not a racist because he was extremely beneficial to the African-American community in Washington, DC. He just, I guess, didn't have the guts to break that color line until 1954. But even in 1954, he broke the color line with Washington with a black Cuban, uh, Carlos Paula, uh, who was the first black player. Carlos Paula was definitely a black man, um, but he was Hispanic and spoke you know, Spanish all the time. The actual first African-American black player for the senators was Joe Black in 1957, who, who finished his career, his long pitching career by pitching seven games in relief <laughs> for Washington in 1957. He eventually became uh, the first black scout for the senators in 1958. But obviously, as far as race is concerned, I think we're all familiar with the, uh, the, the horrible statements that Calvin Griffith made uh, at a, uh, you know, a, a smoker meeting in the 1970s, um, which uh, raised the ire. And of course, now his, his statue has been taken down from the park uh, in Minnesota for the racial statements that he was. Calvin Griffith was a closet racist, and <laughs> there were not a lot of black players that were on the, um, uh, the Minnesota team. And there weren't a lot of black players when he took over in 1956. So uh, excuse me, uh, go down to the Paul, oh, just to let no, you know, you've about got about it. two minutes uh, and then we'll take some questions. Uh, the, the, I'll, I'll be finished with that. Uh, uh, Cambria, uh, Cambria might be, you know, a little obscure to a lot of the baseball people. But he was highly, highly influential in the fact that he opened up the racial lines as far as dark skinned players was concerned, because a lot of the Cuban players that he brought in, there's no question about them. They were rather dark, but he was able to have them he was, he was able to get them passed off as Cuban or Hispanic for the Washington press because of the Washington press's great relationship with Clark Griffith. When Calvin Griffith, everything changed. So thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, if you've got some questions, I'd love to, love to answer. Yeah, so we've got, we've got a few questions in here uh, that, I will, uh, that I will pass along. I'm going to try to get to the right one. Here we go. 
uh, from George. Did Cambria have anything to do with the legendary tryout Fidel is supposed to have had with the White Sox? <clears throat> Both Peter Barkman, whom everyone loves and adore from Sabre, and um, Roberto Gonzalez Echevarria, who wrote um, The Times of Havana, both of them categorically deny that he ever got a tryout from Cambria or the Yankees or the Giants or the Reds. Now, I talked with Camilo Pascual. Pascual says it's absolutely possible that Cambria knew about Fidel because Fidel knew everything that was going on in Cuba in the 1940s and the 50s. But Fidel never played an organized game of ball. There's one instance of, of Fidel playing on a college level team where he pitched and lost a game for his college in 1948. But other than that, there's no mention of Fidel ever playing in any organized ball or sport. So, but as you know, if, 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 if you've got the facts or the, the facts of the fiction, print the fiction, it makes more money. So it, it became a story with its own life and Cambria kept it going by, by the hyperbole of saying, yeah, I could have had Fidel, but it, it's, it's hyperbole. It didn't happen. Gotcha. Uh, Michael asks, uh, what was Landis worried about uh, with scouts owning teams? <clears throat> I, I think it was, uh, it, it was the conflict of interests about scouts owning a team and getting players to play on that particular team and making it a conduit for them to just have a pipeline into their own team. Um, I, should, I, should, I should research that just a little bit more. The book's not going to be coming out until next year because I'm having difficulty getting into the library at University of Miami, and I have a lot of Latin research that has to be done. So I'm still researching as I'm writing a lot more of these questions that come up, and I, I appreciate that question because I should look more into it as to why Landis was concerned about that. But he passed the rule that scouts couldn't own clubs in 1940. Uh, final, I think we'll go with this as the final question here from John. And, and I think you touched on this uh, just a little bit. Um, you know, Joe, the, many of the Cubans that Joe signed uh, would, would be viewed as lighter skinned. Uh, and the question is, are there, are there other important Cambria signings uh, of darker skinned Cubans? And did maybe these, these uh, signings reflect Griffith's preferences uh, or more Cambria's judge of talent? No, it was Griffith who said he was not opposed to having a, a, a dark skinned player, but just like uh, Branch Rickey, he said he wanted the right boy. And so uh, Cambria, because he had the pipeline in Cuba, went to dark-skinned Latin players. Um, actually, Angel's school was supposed to be the first guy uh, to integrate in 1954. He got hurt in spring training, and he brought up Carlos Paula instead. Also, there was another guy by the name of Raul Sanchez, who was supposed to be the first black pitcher. He never made it out of double A. So he had other dark-skinned Latin players. As I said, I just think that Grief, Griffiths was tremulous about having African-American players on the team. He still felt that the Negro Leagues should uh, better organize themselves and become a better league. He even went so far as to say he wouldn't be adverse to a three-way World Series between the National League, the American League, and a good Negro League team. And that was back in 19, uh, before Jackie Robinson came. Uh, uh, actually, it was earlier than that. Uh, I got uh, 1932 was the, I got it right here where he said that properly organized baseball will, will pay, says Clark Griffith. And that uh, comes from the, uh, the Baltimore Afro-American. So he, he wanted black baseball to organize better to make itself a better product to sell. Uh, why he didn't want blacks on the team, I can't really say, but he wasn't a racist and he was good to the African-American community. All right, well, 
Paul, thank you so much. Thanks for uh, thanks for soldiering on while we figured out the technology. Thank you. And uh, thanks for uh, thanks for wrapping up our first day of Saber Virtual. We did have one question uh, from Michael about the other presentation, so we are uh, we are just doing the three tonight. Uh, we may have uh, Richard Moraski's presentation show up at a later date, but we will uh, we'll be sure to let people know. Uh, join us tomorrow if you can. Uh, tomorrow's session is going to be hosted by Dan Evans and will include research from Tom Thress, David W. Smith, Mark Pankin, and Dan will uh, have a conversation with Corey Schwartz from Major League Baseball. Uh, so thanks, uh, thanks everybody for joining. Thanks to all of our research pre presenters this evening and uh, hope everybody has a great night. Thank you.